Welcome back to another episode of the Hermit Poetry Series. I'm Neil Aiken, and on this channel I read poetry, mostly work by contemporary poets, occasionally some of my own, and once in a while poems from the past. Um, for the last few weeks we've been doing a little deviation from our usual poem a day format, and I've been reading and discussing um, a particular poem by Li Bai um, as it is translated into English. We looked at 13 different translations, um, or at least I, I read through 13 different translations after initially going through the original text in Chinese, um, reading it in Mandarin, and then talking about some of the uh, sort of some of the linguistic and stylistic and formalistic uh, aspects of the poem as it appears in the original text. And then um, last most recent episode in this particular translation series, we went through three particular translations, um, two relatively early, uh, one from Pound, one from Witter Bidner, and one from the mid 1980s from uh, Gary Geddes and George Liang. Um, today, we're going to continue in that vein, um, but look at a different three translations. And we will, I think I, I've been finding that working through um, in smaller bite sizes is, uh, has been a more effective format for this particular um, approach. Uh, to look at translation, to look at the choices that translators make, things that get revealed, things that get um, obscured, um, and in a few cases, a few cases, things that uh, disappear completely. So let's look at our first translation of today's episode. We're going to go with the 1990 translation by David Young of the poem, um, which he entitles, Taking Leave of a Friend. Here at the city wall, green mountains to the north, white water winding east, we part. One tumbleweed, 10,000 miles to go, high clouds, wandering thoughts, sunset, old friendship. You wave, moving off, your horse whinnies twice. Um, so a few things that we'll notice almost immediately. One is when you look upon when you look at the poem on the page, you will see that it is formatted. Um, you know, stylistically, its presentation on the page resembles that of a more contemporary free verse uh, format. Uh, closer inspection reveals that he's actually preserved most of these couplets. It's just that he's opted to create a quatrain, a four-line stanza at the front, and he is buried or, or combined uh, some other features in the closing uh, triplet uh, to kind of obscure a little bit of the, the coupling up that's here. But the heart of the poem still has couplets, and even the opening stanza is really two couplets. <clears throat> um, so we have its presentation looks a little bit different. Um, what we get, and I think this is where Young's translation excels, is this sense of a very spared, stripped down um, version of the poem, that we uh, we lose a lot of the ornamentation and elaboration and expansion that tends to happen in other translations. And instead, the goal seems to be to jettison as much as possible the Western tendency to insert the self, to, to grand, you know, to make grand the self, the I in the poem. And instead, it is very much in the, the, uh, the, the Chinese tradition of this um, of like this classical Chinese approach in which the self gets gets um, put in second place to sort of the grandness of of, of nature and the the giganticness of everything else. Um, so this privileging of the natural world over the human, um, while it's still alluding to its connection um, and do doing so in more of an implicit way, this is very much the aesthetic that I think the original. Um, represents and, and achieves. So um, I think this is one thing that's really quite good. In terms of, you know, another aspect of this, in, in doing this, it also achieves something uh, really remarkable, which is it creates a tonal or emotional translation of the original text. We get, in English, the same feeling that we would have um, when we read it in Chinese. And I think that's, like, really difficult to pull off. Um, so, so David Young's translation really achieves that. We, on a more nuts and bolts level, looking specifically at some of these lines, um, you'll note that he does this while at the same time not necessarily following exactly the same parallel structures that exist in the original. Um, here, here at the city wall, green mountains to the north, white water winding east, we part. Um, he has 
created a different effect, which is whereas the original lines things up um, more directly as parallels, um, so you can see them like side by side on the page, he sandwiches them almost, uh, you know, not quite chiastically, but but in a sense that the there is the opening here at the city wall, and the we part. This this kind of frames the moment of the two physical bodies of these individuals, and then the landscape appears in the middle: green mountains to the north, white water winding east, and that takes its center stage. Um, I think this is very much what the Chinese does, which is like it pushes hard on the visual impression of the land, what the scene that presents before us and ourselves as the speaker and the friend um, are, are pushed to the small point. They, they, they shrink in comparison, still part of the, the fact of the, the, uh, the scene, but without necessarily being the primary focus of the scene. Um, it is the landscape, but it's the view that really is um, phenomenal. Um, and next section, one tumbleweed, 10,000 miles to go, the uh, direct opposite or opposition of one tumbleweed, 10,000 miles to go. How, um, how Young does this is simply, he sets them next to each other, but as parallel lines. So one image and then the following image. There is no comma, there is no semicolon, there's no colon, there's no bridging language. It just simply presents one image and then another image and then the next and the next. And this this almost like slideshow um, presentation, uh, one fading into the other is very much the original um, function of the text in Chinese. Um, so let's see. And then from here on, we, we get, uh, we move towards this final moment. You wave moving off your horse whinnying twice, um, puts the pressure back on, <coughs> puts the pressure back on the, uh, or the focus back on sort of that, that departure. Um, here, uh, Young definitely pushes it onto the other person as this is the, one is static and the other is moving. Um, the horse moves, the person moves. Um, we don't see anything. Uh, the, the speaker is actually the fixed point and invisible. There is no I in here. It is a we, which becomes a you. Um, so I think this is really like a, an interesting way to capture some of the tonal elements of the original text. Um, so some nitpicky things that I think um, we, we can look at as, as sort of like given sort of the how successful it is are there places where we might be losing something um we lose a little bit you know the the green the white get retained mountains and water gets retained north and east we lose a little bit of that opposition between the the stretch or the the horizontal versus the the curve we preserve the winding here we lose the the sense of a stretched out before us view um and it's i mean i think that's a minor one in terms of what what's gained um the sense of a place of parting like we we here he moves it to the front and he says here at the the city wall there's no here's the place of parting it's all condensed down collapsed down into the here at the city wall um and I think perhaps the, the weakest part of the poem is not a gigantic weakness as much as it is that the sunset and old friendship, um, well, the sunset and the old friendship opposition is probably the most worn out. Um, I think here we lose sort of that motion of the setting sun um, in opposition with the clouds. Um, and because of how he structured it, we only get parts, certain parts of those parallels are preserved and other parts are kind of um, obscured by this type of framing. So I, I think, you know, this is a choice. This is a choice that, that uh, Young makes in order to preserve this particular or make the emotional part of the poem carry over. There are certain um, uh, stylistic or art, 
you know, linguistic features that make the poem work in parallel in the original language is simply take a back seat. We, we can't do everything. And so these are the choices that Young makes. Um, okay. Okay, so let's look at our next translation. This one comes from Xu Yanzhong from uh, Songs of the Immortals, an anthology of classical Chinese poetry, Penguin 1994. Uh, Xu Yanzhong translates the poem as Farewell to a Friend. Green mountains bar the northern sky. White water girds the eastern town. Here is the place to say goodbye. You'll drift like lonely thistle down. With floating clouds you'll float away, like parting day I'll part from you. We wave as you start on your way, our steeds still neigh. Adieu, adieu. So, um, some things to, to note about Xu Yanzhong's translation. Um, quite obviously, the, the most prominent thing here is the choice to to replicate sort of some of the rhythm and music of the original by leaning heavily into the rhyme. In this particular case, the rhyme is amplified by the fact that it goes beyond even the original. In the original poem, there is a, uh, it's the, every second line is what rhymes. And, um, and that sort of, uh, yeah, it's more than every second line that rhymes. It's, it's the same rhyme that recurs all the way throughout um, Xu Yanzhong's chosen to go a different route, um, capture or suggest some level of that music without necessarily preserving the exact original rhyme scheme. Um, some other things that, that are, I think are particularly interesting. Um, so Xu Yanzhong preserves the, uh, the green white opposition, the mountains water oppositions, the eastern town versus the northern sky in fact when you look at it on the page he has lined them up like vertically so that we can stare at those oppositions what's interesting to me is his particular choice to translate and to create that opposition between the straight stretching out and the curve um, that's implied in the original in the second line um, that the hung versus the rao um, that that opposition gets recreated in the poem as bar and girds. Um, and this is interesting to me because uh, I think Xu Yanzhong's suggestion that girds might work, um, I think here it's an architectural way that it works. The bar and the girds are thinking of this in terms of an archi architectural format. Uh, we'll see girds reappear in a different translation later on, not in this episode, in a different episode. But someone else uses girds and uses it in a very different way, which I think is even more successful. But I think what Xu Yanzhong offers us is perhaps the first time that someone has opted to, to really try to find a new way to kind of capture um, and at the same time, not just capture, but create a more compelling linkage um, or, or parallel between the two parts um, that that sort of the gesture of the stretching out versus the gesture of the turning or the the bending um, okay so they feel like they're in the same family um, so other things that that I think are working fairly well um, I, I think here Xu Yanzhong attempts to find like a, a you know, substitute something uh, for the the image of uh, so the artisma uh, flower, you know, floating in the wind, which doesn't really have a great Western equivalent. The tumbleweeds has been sort of the fallback for most people so far, um, with the exception of um, uh, you know sort of the the loosened water plant, which is probably the least compelling of the ones. Here, Xu Yuanzhong opts for a loose thistle down, which I think maybe image-wise is, is really close to what we're seeing, which is something that drifts on the wind, that's very lightweight, that immerses, um, that appears as part of the, the pollination process of the, um, of the flower. Um, is, it, is it exact? Um, no. Um, I think it works. I think there is the perhaps the weakness of the poem uh, 
or at least the thing it struggles with, is in introducing this high level um, and regularity of rhyme. Um, now it feels that certain words get lost because they're so prominently pronounced. Um, so when you have Eastern Town and then Thistle Down, um, I think I'm losing the image here. Um, the Thistle Down now feels mostly in service to the Eastern Town that, that preceded it. And that may not I don't think that's the intention, but I think that's the effect is, is what we get instead is that because of it being so close in rhyme um, and because of the regularity of the rhyme throughout that we, the sound ends up drowning out the visual. Um, and I think that's, that's perhaps, I think the misstep that happens in this poem is that the auditory components become more important than the visual components. Um, even even sort of the the ending which is supposed to be a sound based ending I, I still there we get pulled out even further um the hor the horses are now neighing a jew a jew giving them um sort of an even more human element to them than was original so anthropomorphizing the horses in this particular way and then inserting in um, sort of a fair, farewell, a term for farewell that doesn't originate in either the English or the um, original Chinese um, is a distraction for me, at least as a reader. And I, I think I don't quite feel connected at this point. It's it it's an accidental bit of humor for me, at least, to imagine the horses saying adieu, adieu. Um, so I, I think the, this is some of the struggle with this particular translation. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see some other things that get floating. I think the other choice is partly bound by the rhyme scheme. Um, we end up with some grammatical issues or some other challenges that, again, I think the poem suffers in its effort to live up to this ambition to create sort of the formal structure and the rhyme. So examples might be like by this this particular phrasing shows up a couple times one is like floating cloud you'll float away um that doubling <coughs> that doubling up i think um just somehow cheapens it it doesn't quite feel as resonant parting day i'll part from you it, it feels it's trying to be clever in doing these type of um word plays and and doubles you know, and, and sort of repetition or reinvention of the the term. Um, so this type of wordplay, I think, um, actually, while it may be trying to echo some of the things that occur in the original, um, but transpose it onto a different part of the line or a different part of the image, I think have a counterproductive effect. Um, so things that work, I think the bar and the gird is an interesting choice but overall I feel like this poem is trying too hard to recreate something in the auditory sphere and somehow that translation ends up losing most of what was appearing in the intellectual and um, sort of the conceptual and the the, the visual level of the poem um, okay so I, I think we should probably move on So our, our last one that we're going to look at today is um, translation by Wai Lim Yip uh, from Chinese Poetry and Anthology of Major Modes and Genres, uh, Duke University Press, 1997. I think uh, Wai, Wai Lim Yip's translation, and especially, I would say even more so, the book, the anthology is phenomenal in the depth of scholarship and discussion that go into introducing these different um, uh, forms that appear throughout Chinese uh, literature, especially in poetry, and sort of a consideration of what's going on in there. Um, for all this work, the scholarly work that goes into it, um, and his efforts to kind of present things, you know, both give us the visual you know, the graphical representation, the original text in Chinese, in calligraphy often, 
and then sort of supplement it with a raw text and then go through and get the translation. I think really lays bare sort of the, a lot of the translation process. At the same time, I don't think that he's always as successful as he intends to be. Um, and I think oftentimes it's an illustrative example to say like, here, here's a translation that comes out of this. Um, but I think that there are other translations that, that do succeed on a greater level. So what is it that we can learn from Bailim Yip's translation? Well, let's, let's look at it. He translates the poem this time as taking leave of a friend. Green mountains lie across the north wall. White water winds the east city. Here, once we part, lone tumbleweed, a million miles to travel, floating clouds, a wanderer's mood, setting sun, an old friend's feeling. We wave hands. You go from here. Nay, nay, goes the horses. In Wylim Yip's translation, I, I think a number of things we we discover um, preserved of, of particularly well. One is is he chooses a more subtle opposition between the the horizontal and the vertical or horizontal and the curved so the the yeah the straight and the curved here um the green mountains simply lie across the north wall whereas the the white water winds past the east city so it's um he tries not to overemphasize, but yet still preserve in a more subtle way sort of the horizontal straightness versus the curvature of the river. Um, so I think that is uh, particularly effective. The, uh, the other interesting thing that, that Yip does is he, um, he wants to preserve the parallel structures and parallel oppositions that appear throughout the poem, but does so without um, without doing an explicit connector in the sense that he doesn't use like uh, sort of the, the metaphor and simile to do this. Instead, it is simply a semicolon that he uses to break things up. Lone tumbleweed, a million miles to travel. Um, there is, again, this idea of juxtaposition, placing them side by side. The semicolon gives him a way out to say that they are linked, but they're not equivalent. Um, and I think that's that's kind of a, an effective way to do it. Um, do I do I think that necessarily we have to rely on punctuation to do that? I'm not certain. I think here it's a way to go, um, and I think you know it does at least provide the reader and someone who's reading it out loud sort of cues as to what to do with those lines, where the Caesarea should go. Um, Let's see. Uh, so a few interpolation, a few things that get interpolated um, and modified. So one interpolation is basically the the um, the change away from ten thousand li to a million miles. And so a million miles is in our contemporary culture a sense of that vastness of impossibility of distance. Um, and I think, you know, I understand sort of the reason to lean towards this as a, as a, you know, a way to emphasize that. Um, yeah, so I think sort of the contrast between loan and a million miles um, really has a dramatic effect at this point. Um, I feel maybe I'm a purist in this respect, but I kind of like 10,000 nonetheless, even if it's more words. Um, it does feel like that is part of the, um, the idiosyncratic nature of like this, this particular comparison, which comes directly out of the language. Um, I don't know. That's personal preference. I, I kind of like that one better. Um, the floating clouds and wanders mood here we, and then setting sun, old friends feeling we, we have here preserved then a sense of feeling, um, but here, I think we lose the thoughts, like the wanderer's mood, as opposed to wanderer's thoughts or intentions. Um, I think we're now in the territory of obscuring a little bit of the original. Um, the floating clouds are set in opposition to the setting sun. Here, the, uh, the natural object is given sort of direction and action. Um, and it's it's done in this infinitive form. Um, I think there's a consistency with what he's doing, um, but uh, I'm not entirely sold yet either. I, I feel like it's it's becomes obvious that this is a construction that's being attempted.
Um, and uh, let's see. You go from here. We wave hands. You go from here. Um, I, again, it's it can be more direct, um, but I also feel there's something obscured um, in the sense that it really is their departing. Um, both of them will actually turn and leave at this point, but um, one of them obviously is leaving on a longer journey. Um, I don't know. It just feels maybe a touch too colloquial. I don't know. Uh, nay, nay goes the horses. Here, I think we, we... So one of the reasons why I think like the go from here is present, in addition to being like a very literal sort of uh, rendition of the, the chu that, that, that takes place at the end of, um, of that line, um, is to set up this opposition with the horses. And I think this is kind of a wordplay that doesn't quite work. Um, for for the primary reason that the verb agreement breaks down, um, nay nay goes the horses, but goes actually should be go, um, if we wanted to make this agree properly with the plural horses. So I think this is just um, is this simply you know a typo or a mistake that slipped through, or is this intentional? I don't know. Um, I think that it is meant to sort of turn the word go around so that we go from here in terms of a literal departure and then goes the horses is a way to kind of like mimic the the sense that something instead of them leaving now it's the the way of speaking how they speak it um and so i think that that you know this is what how the things go or what you know what they say um so I think it's trying really hard to be clever in terms of that mirroring between the go and the goes, but I think the distraction ends up happening because it doesn't actually agree. Uh, so there's there's a lot of interesting things happening in this particular poem. Um, and I would say that uh, at the very least, it's worth getting his book um, to study what he's talking about, both in terms of the styles and the, the particular formal constraints and ideas, as well as to think about um, you know, like have access to a lot of these raw translations, which it's not every single poem, but most of the poems he presents with their their literal sort of the the spreadsheet or the grid of of language, so that you can see exactly some of the things that are happening in the text. Um, okay, and so. So that's about it for today. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please like this video and comment below. Um, subscribe to this channel and check back often. We'll have new content every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Uh, I try to put in a, a certain amount of time to, to make each of these episodes. I really appreciate hearing from you about what you like, what you uh, think I should tackle next. Um, I will try to keep a mix between uh, this translation series, which uh, will probably wrap up in a few more episodes. I've decided to take a few more episodes to go through these translations, just because I felt it really wouldn't do it justice to breeze through all the translations in a more superficial way. Um, this way, at least, I can talk specifically about some of the things that I find um, inspiring and interesting about the translation and the translation choices, as well as uh, things that um, strike me as being missed opportunities or revelatory in terms of how what we learn about um, the limits once we've made commitments to certain different stylistic uh, um, efforts in our translations.